Um, first of all, thank you, John, and thank you to the organizing committee for inviting me. Um, it, is, it is indeed sad that uh, Zhao Yueja wasn't able to join us um, for this, this event. But um, one of the things that I did when I was thinking about the presentation, John invited me last week, I think it was. Um, when I was thinking about the presentation, I decided to sort of like think of it in some terms that I think are in dialogue with some of Zhao's work. And so uh, hopefully you'll see some traces of Zhao with us today. Um, and uh, also, I, I won't take uh, any offense if anyone decides to leave during the fire drill. Um, <laughs> uh, but uh, I assure you that, that Laura has told us that, 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 that there will, in fact, be no calamity um, impending if you stay. All right, so civil society in global China, changing spaces, shifting discourses. Um, my work over the last few years has, has focused on China and Chinese media in part, uh, largely on uh, the globalization of Chinese media, particularly uh, commercial media. Uh, commercial media are much more globalized. I'm going to talk about, in a way, the intersection between this, the, these global commercial enterprises and state institutions, and that's sort of where we're headed. But um, I finished a book in 2007 that was published, Playing to the World's Biggest Audience, The Globalization of Chinese Film and TV. And in that book, I sort of map out um, key players in uh, Chinese commercial media and how they've dealt with globalization and how they've dealt with the sorts of uh, changes that have occurred in the last 20 years. Uh, I also co-edited co with Hemet Shaw a book that's coming out this year, Reorienting Global Communication. Uh, in, this, in this project, what we did is we um, had a number of authors uh, comparing Indian media with Chinese media. And it was a very useful set of exchanges around the book, and um, it was very enlightening for me in, in particular uh, to think about some of the comparisons. Uh, and, and that's coming out with Illinois. And then finally, the project I'm working on now is a book called Media Capital. And I'm going to talk a little bit about Media Capital today, although I'm not going to go into the particulars of it because I want to I get to some uh, other issues. But essentially, what informed my work with playing to the world's uh, biggest audience has been a, a lot of work in cultural studies and critical geography that I employ in my work and trying to think about the ways in which um, the, the concentrations of capital in certain kinds of media industries, how patterns of circulation affect, uh, affect media on a whole variety of levels, and the ways in which the social and the cultural interact with um, those processes. So I think a lot about space. And I'm going to take you through some maps today, uh, colonial maps indeed, uh, and talking about the ways that Chinese media uh, have shifted over time. So media capital, what I'm, what I'm doing with this is I'm, I'm actually making comparisons, not with, just with what's happened with Chinese media, but I'm thinking also about Indian media, uh, thinking about media in the Middle East, thinking about Latin American media. And the things that I think about is the way that the shifting geography um, is engendered with respect to things like markets and audiences, uh, productive forces, and the imaginary worlds in which these media uh, enterprises operate. Uh, one of the key issues for me is that notion of capital, both media capital in thinking in terms of resources, but capital in thinking about geographic locales that become centers and why they become centers, especially in a globalizing world. So that's generally what my project is about. And when we think, whoa, how'd that happen? When we think about, um, when we think about global media, one of the things that's important is we think, for example, about Hollywood, and people think, well, Hollywood is ubiquitous. Ho Hollywood is everywhere. And yet, quite interestingly, when we think about Hollywood media, um, we aren't thinking about the fact that the industry itself imagines the globe not as a vast expanse of undifferentiated space, but it has very particular markets in mind when it's thinking about the world. And these markets that uh, generate more than 80% of their revenues are the ones that I've circled here. So when they think about the globe, they're not thinking about nearby neighbors in Latin America. They're not thinking about Africa. They're thinking largely about the wealthy economies of Europe. They're thinking about Japan. They're thinking about Taiwan. They're thinking about Australia. Likewise, and that's kind of cool, I didn't know that it'd take. Um, likewise, with Indian media, we've seen uh, shifting contours as far as they're concerned uh, from being pretty much uh, a national, nationally oriented media enterprises. We've seen the expansion into the Gulf states and then Europe and North America and Australia. We see similarly that Miami is emerging as a very important center of transnational Latin American media. 
and that those markets that it imagines most specifically are Latin America, but also North America very prominently, and then some movement into Europe as well. We're also seeing some circulation in Southeast Asia. When we think in terms of Arab media, we think about the Gulf states quite clearly are very important at this point, but also North Africa and into Europe. So, and then when we think about Nigerian media, we, I did a little bit of work with a graduate student um, uh, trying to get a handle on the distribution of Nigerian video uh, films. And these are the sorts of places where uh, there's a great deal of circulation of those video films from what we were able to discern with that project. So thinking about globalization is always already about thinking about transnationalization, but thinking about particular spaces and the reconfiguration of those spaces. Not that nations have become inconsequential, but that increasingly media enterprises are imagining and envisioning their commercial operations as extending across state lines, and that's a very important part of their growth. Um, so we see this with all media. Now, today what I want to talk about is the ways that spaces can change over time with respect to media enterprises and institutions. And I'm going to take Chinese media as the case example uh, because we wanted to have uh, part of this talk focus on Chinese media. And this is the paradox that I want to uh, consider with respect to Chinese media. We're seeing increasing transnational flows, and I'll map out what some of those flows are. We're seeing a growing diversity of media resources, that is technologies, delivery platforms, modes of engagement. We're seeing a pr proliferation of creative centers. Uh, proliferation of uh, content and types of content, but paradoxically we're also seeing gro growing self-censorship and state influence. And that's the paradox that I want to talk about today. Um, in, a, in an era of globalization, the People's Republic of China is ex exerting it an in inordinate amount of influence over Chinese media flows, circulations, and content. So, oh, that didn't come out well at all. Oh, that's terrible. And that may be the same, well, okay, nevertheless. Um, so going historically through um, the, the development of Chinese media, there's this, this uh, I'm gonna talk about screen industries, first the film industry and then the television industry, and a little bit about the internet at the end. But in the very early years of the 20th century, in the 1920s as the film industry was developing, there was a kind of uh, nascent nationalism in China and the film industry was in some respects reflecting that, but there was also a great deal of, uh, of social disorder, warlords, uh, civil war. And during that period of time, as the film industry was evolve, evolving, it was evolving around particular cities, Shanghai, Hong Kong, Canton. Distribution was haphazard given the social conditions. Um, the exhibition of films was largely on B circuits, uh, and this was a silent cinema. What happens, in the 30s is that civil war and the Japanese invasion basically shifts the geography of the Chinese film industry into Southeast Asia. And it's really fascinating because uh, prominent firms that were in Shanghai and Hong Kong moved their operations to Southeast Asia. They developed film circuits in basically in this area of Southeast Asia. Um, they actually buy theaters. Uh, they develop the land around those theaters. They build amusement parks. They, they, they develop a functioning distribution system for Chinese films, but also for other films that they worked through that cinema circuit. And the reason that they moved to Southeast Asia is for years, there had been populations from China which had settled in various parts of Southeast Asia. But Southeast Asia was also very prosperous in the 1930s. And that colonial stability was attractive to these early enterprises. So, as the industry moves down here, we have multi-site production. There's still production in Shanghai, Hong Kong, and increasingly si Singapore. We have enterprises, film enterprises, that are basically familial forms of capitalism. In the 1950s, something very interesting happens, is after the circuit has established itself and become relatively prosperous and stable, um, the, the terms of, of, of politics in the region begin to shift. Uh, mainland China becomes the People's Republic of China, uh, Taiwan becomes the Republic of China, and uh, the, the PRC basically walls itself off from commercial media during this period of time. Taiwan is open and very receptive to, um, to commercial media, but only receptive to the extent that we're thinking in terms of Mandarin media. They were especially interested in imports of Mandarin uh, language uh, film, although they, they allowed other in, 
in as well. In Southeast Asia, there were waves of nationalism sweeping across Southeast Asia. And so what the industry does, and the industry was b basically in Singapore, the industry reconfigures its terrain of circulation and shifts its operations northward into Hong Kong, where the Shaw brothers and Cath Cathay build major studios and where they develop the center of their distribution system that continues to operate throughout Southeast Asia, but also Taiwan becomes increasingly important and Hong Kong becomes important. By the 1970s, the film industry is going through a very troublesome period of time. Television's introduced into many of these markets. Many of the film companies sort of retreat uh, from film and refigure their resources moving into television. Television, of course, is tightly controlled in Singapore by the state, tightly controlled in Taiwan by the state and, and the leading political party. In Hong Kong, uh, really the only place where commercial media operations, commercial television operations are allowed to emerge, television becomes very, very important, but also very local. And so during the 70s, what we see here is that the distribution circuits of old begin to dissolve. Um, and, and Hong Kong emerges as a very important center for film production. Film goes through a period of structural readjustment and then is able to sort of find its feet around local exhibition and independent film production. And the way that they circulate their products overseas is through pre-sale agreements into the territories. And it actually expands from Southeast Asia and Taiwan into Japan and Korea as well. And one of the things about Hong Kong that's very important is that at the television industry was both resolutely commercial and very, very popular. In a very quick period of time, everybody had a television set. And television was extremely popular, and uh, performance on television was, was very, very important. It was the focus of cultural life and the economy. It was beneath the contempt of the colonial overlords, and so it was ba allowed to sort of operate on its own terms. And between the music industry, which emerges, the canto pop industry, which emerges during this period of time, the television industry and the film industry, you have these, these sort of uh, very uh, propitious synergies that happen during this period of time that make Hong Kong a very important center for media creativity and for media operations. It turns out that Hong Kong, as a relatively stable and cosmopolitan society with a rising middle class and a resolutely commercial uh, set of media enterprises, becomes sort of the center of Chinese popular culture. And it not only has influence throughout these regions where, there's, where there are exports um, taking place, uh, some with film and some with television, some with both, but it also starts having influence uh, into mainland China as well as China opens up in the 80s and the 90s. So during that period of time, Hong Kong is really, is, is sort of the, it's the apotheosis of, of, of Chinese commercial media. And yet by the, by the year 2000, things are starting to change very dramatically. Um, in the year 2000, we see expansion in the patterns of circulation into various markets. We see neoliberal trade and neoliberal policy <clears throat> starting to influence media in many parts of the world, making it easier to trade media products across national boundaries. Um, pressures for liberalization of markets mean that film and television industries become more receptive <clears throat> to the circulation of uh, transnational media products. We have cable, satellite, VCD, and DVD introduced. And <clears throat> very interestingly, media that had been very much geared at, at broad popular audiences starts dispersing into more frag fragmented audiences. As those fragmented audiences proliferate and as media technologies proliferate, the industry goes into a cycle of hyper-production. Quality starts to go down. Even though people are making a lot of money, the, the, the quality of production is going down for a series of complicated reasons. Piracy starts to emerge. And then also competition for what will be the centers of production in Chinese media begins to emerge. We see that uh, competition becoming an increasingly important force. Co-production, conglomeration start to take hold. And so in some sense, we're seeing a very open moment, uh, a moment in which there are a lot of possibilities on the table because of changes in trade policies, changes in technology, 
uh, changes in technology, changes in corporate configuration. We also have the emergence of an East Asian youth culture where you start to see that kids in Shanghai and kids in Hong Kong and Taipei and Tokyo have more in common with each other than kids in Shanghai have in common with uh, kids in uh, Chongqing, uh, perhaps. So this East Asian uh, youth culture tar starts taking hold. There's a lot of circulation, not only of Hong Kong media products, but of Japanese and Korean media products throughout the region. And so we have this sort of moment, this potential moment of tremendous openness uh, taking place. But what we have seen since the year 2000 is a very significant shift. And this is sort of, this is the, the payoff for all my map making here. Um, <clears throat> and that is that the People's Republic of China, the GDP basically tripled between 2003 and today. Um, the, the GDP of the People's Republic of China is now approaching $4 billion, making it um, larger than the GDP of France or Great Britain, slightly smaller than Germany, um, and smaller than Japan, but making it basically the fourth largest uh, economy in the world with respect to GDP. <clears throat> in addition to that growth in GDP, the state becomes much more assertive about its policies, not only as far as domestic economic policies, but wanting to project its influence um, culturally throughout the PRC, but also overseas. So we see the state and capital coming together within the PRC and official culture becoming increasingly important. And that official culture manifests it through self through two very important institutions. One is CCTV, which is the only, uh, is the only national network in China, uh, which commands the vast, uh, the vast uh, majority of revenues from advertising and essentially serves as the surrogate for um, the state within the realm of television. We have China Film doing a similar thing with film distribution in China, controlling joint ventures in the country, controlling uh, co-productions, and so we get particular kinds of films as opposed to other, and I can talk about content uh, when we have time. We have the emergence of uh, internet firewalls and internet monitors as part of state policy. Um, and, and we have codes for imp importation, how many films can come in, what percentage of imported television programming can take place in the P PRC. We have uh, guidelines for joint ventures. We have guidelines for co-productions that create limits as well. And yet, for all this assertion of policy, this, this assertion of, of state um, influence over the media, uh, the main, mainland China becomes sort of the market that is pulling resources inexorably towards itself. If you want to be a commercial media enterprise that deals in Chinese media, you have to take account of the mainland market at this point. There's no way around it. And the state's very aware of this. And so this market pull, this way in which the, what goes on within the PRC starts to shape the transnational circulations of Chinese media, which had been relatively free and open and full of sat satire and irony and um, all sorts of, um, in some ways, uh, humorous and subversive forms of popular culture. And in this way, um, the PRC has been able to reassert its influence and encourage self-censorship, right? So horror films are not allowed in China. Uh, films in which, uh, films in which, uh, films in which uh, gangsters win in the end are not allowed in China. Um, television programs like Supergirl, which was a takeoff on, uh, on Pop Idol, the singing contest thing, American Idol in the United States, uh, was basically <clears throat> marginalized because it proved extraordinarily popular and especially popular because people got to vote for who they wanted to win and the state wasn't real happy about that. Um, media enterprises find themselves in this situation now where if you want to be part of transnational commercial Chinese media, you increasingly have to play by the rules of the Chinese state. And this is a very interesting move. In many other parts of the world where we see this opening up, this kind of, this kind of globalization and transnationalization, we're actually seeing with Chinese media, which were fairly transnational and fairly open, a kind of closing down um, uh, due to that, uh, those state policies. And there's nothing wrong with having national state policies, but the kinds of policies are, um, well, they're subject to, to a great deal of discussion. We can go into some of that later. Despite this move by the state, despite these moves by the state, and despite these developments, we still see, however, that other side. Um, we see gray and black markets 
um, in the circulation of media products. Anything that the state doesn't allow is available on the street corner tomorrow in DVD form or available on the internet or whatever. And so there's this way in which the state is fighting this desperately to maintain control in a circumstances where they find it very difficult uh, to actually manage flows. We see internet evasions as well. The way that people are able to use the internet, um, certain users are able to use the internet to get around firewalls and get around monitors. We also have, despite the fact that the state wants to favor particular media institutions, audiences, are, audiences and people in the media industries are very aware of creative hierarchies. Um, who, is, who is doing uh, very interesting, progressive, and evocative work? Um, that sort of consciousness persists. And so in some respects, what's on CCTV and what's available from China Film can appear at many points to be uh, rather tired and, um, and, and too uh, too cozy with state interests. And then finally, the persistence of East Asian youth culture. I mean, it's growing more and more intense. Um, uh, and, and it's going to be interesting generationally how that plays out. Uh, the impatience with certain uh, boundaries that have been set. And yet, the flip side of that is that in China, while, while you see a lot of young people growing increasingly cosmopolitan, you also see that nationalism is being played um, uh, consistently as a card by the state to to try and rein in that cosmopolitanism um, at various points. So these are the sorts of things that we see. It's, it's an interesting set of paradoxes. And when we think about it in respect to other sort of media centers, we see that, um, that uh, the tendencies that are emerging in the PRC are tendencies that are less, uh, less visible in places like Hollywood, Mumbai, and Miami. But in places like uh, Dubai and Seoul, states are still very strong. And they're, they're playing with these issues as well. So zero, I'm out. <laughs> OK.